Good morning, church. Good morning to those of you who are joining us uh, on the internet. We're glad that you are here. Thank you. Church, I stand before you again today in the name of our most glorious and loving Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to consider with me this morning the story of a man who encountered Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us much about him. It tells us that he was paralyzed. But from the way that Jesus interacts with this man, we can infer some things about his past and about the real needs which brought him to Jesus. Luke tells us part of that story, as Becky read for us already this morning. But I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew as we read and experience it together. Be ready to follow along with me in the book of Matthew in chapter 9. And as we get started, I'd invite you to join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that uh, you would be with us, that you would speak to us as we open your word, that the truth of your character and your love for us would come through to our hearts and would transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. The man sat alone one afternoon, lost in his thoughts. As he watched the day pass, he said nothing. His face revealed the wear of a difficult life. Some kids ran by down the street near him, kicking a ball, shouting to each other, totally free from the anxieties and cares and regrets that now made up this man's life. As he watched them go by, the man remembered what it used to be like to be free like that. He remembered what his life used to be like, and as he began to rehearse the events of his life in his mind, if you had been there, you could have almost read the progression of events in the expressions on his face. The carefree joy of his life as a young boy, the sudden loss that changed his family forever, the stress and burden he suddenly felt as a young man growing up, then the repeated attempts to escape the burden that was now laid on him, trying to find joy, trying to find pleasure. He had had a lot of fun, but also a lot of hurt. It seemed like his life had been a steady descent from one bad choice to another. Until the day, until that one day, that one decision, everything had been fine or, or at least okay, but in one moment that now seemed to live for eternity, that replayed over and over in slow motion in his mind, in that one moment, everything changed. Everything. And he deserved it, he knew. It's what he'd been taught his whole life. As punishment for his sins, God had given him what he deserved. In one moment, he lost the amazing gift of mobility. His life was forever changed. He was paralyzed. He had pleaded with God so many times, God, please hear me. God, please forgive me. Please heal me. But he heard nothing. He felt nothing. His friends had carried him to one doctor after another. The physicians attempted by various means to cure him, but none of it worked. All that it did was make him more skeptical that he could ever be healed. His friends carried him to the priests, even once all the way to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice in the temple. The teachers 
at the synagogue in Capernaum had told him that he had dishonored God by his lifestyle. They told him that he deserved what he got. They looked down on him literally and figuratively. They hated him. People like you, they said. You go and you live your life and you sin against God with no care for his commandments. And then when God gives you what you deserve for breaking his covenant, you come groveling to us. Well, where were you before you were paralyzed? You had plenty of opportunities to repent and to seek forgiveness, but you waited until it was too late. Now look at you. There's nothing we can do for people like you. The man really was sorry for his sins. He was sorry for the life that he had led. He hadn't realized what he had until it was lost for good. He had been unappreciative and ungrateful, and he saw that now. Please, God, please have mercy on me. Forgive me. I'm so sorry for what I have done. Please have mercy on me. But the only sound that he heard was the voice of the religious teachers ringing in his ears. People like you. There's nothing we can do for people like you. The man's life had been a series of bad decisions, but really it only took one. One bad decision and his life was changed forever. He was paralyzed. He'd been too busy to give much thought to where his life was going before. And now all he could do was think about it. And so he spent his days sitting, wishing, regretting. He got some joy from his friends who took care of him. But mostly he just sat and thought and watched the day pass. Hey, a voice interrupted his thoughts. He looked up from where he was sitting. Hey, he's back. It was his friend. He was clearly excited. Who's back? Jesus. Who else? Oh, what do you mean, oh, this is our chance. I already told the rest of the guys. They're going to be here before the hour is over. Jesus from Nazareth, the healer, a prophet, people said. The man, of course, had heard a lot about him. Some people were so excited about this Jesus, they talked about him like he was the Messiah or something. He was nice, they said. He had this power about him that when he spoke, it was like God speaking right to your soul. And the miracles, he had heard of some of them. Actually, one man that he knew, a leper, had met Jesus and had been healed. The man saw the leper. He was definitely healed. What an amazing thought to be completely healed, to have his life back. It would be so different this time, he knew, if he had his life back. He could glorify God. He could work. He could try to pay back his friends. He could go to the synagogue and not be looked down at. He could go to Jerusalem for Passover, for the Day of Atonement, to experience the Day of Atonement, his sins to be wiped away, to be put on the head of that goat and sent away into the wilderness forever. The thought of knowing that he was forgiven actually loomed larger in his dreams than the thought of having his body back. Oh, how he longed for it. But it was just a pipe dream. Maybe it was a hoax. But even if it wasn't, Jesus wasn't going to look kindly on him. It was his own fault. He knew that. He was under God's curse. But what about the leper, though? The former leper. That guy was under God's curse, too, right? And Jesus healed him. Maybe he would have mercy on me. And anyway, what do I have to lose? I'm not going to get more paralyzed. I'm not going to become more ashamed. Jesus is back in town now. This could be my only chance. 
who knows how long he'll be here. And friends, if you had been there watching that day, you would have seen that the expression on the man's face began to change. Where there had been despair and skepticism, suddenly determination appeared. Yes, he thought, my friends are going to take me. I have to see him. I have to see Jesus. Soon enough, the group was rushing down the streets, the paralyzed man lying on his cot, his four friends carrying him hurriedly to the house where they had heard that Jesus was teaching. They recognized the place immediately. There was a small crowd gathered around the house. The inside of the house was packed with people. The courtyard as well was full with people pressed together close to the doors and to the windows, listening to Jesus, trying to get a glimpse of him. They came into the courtyard, unsure how to proceed. The man's friends tried politely at first, but then with increasing urgency to persuade or to force the throng near the door to move out of the way for them, but they wouldn't budge. The man and his friends were so far away, they couldn't even hear Jesus or see him. What do you think? One of them asked. Should we try another time? I don't know, said another. Nobody's going to let us through. We could wait till he dismisses everyone, said one of them, but he might not see us then. No, said the man on the cot. This might be my only chance. I have to see him. Let's open the roof, he said. It's the only way. The friends looked to the side of the house. They saw the stairs leading up to the roof. It seemed like an audacious move, but they all knew that he was right. It was the only way. Their friend had to see Jesus. And so up they went. Quickly, the four friends got to work, pulling up the tiles and setting them aside on top of the roof, pulling away the layers of material until they could finally see through into the room below. There were the faces looking up at them. Some were surprised. Others were irritated. And there they saw him, Jesus, right in the middle. Around him sat all of the important people, his disciples, the religious scholars, and the teachers of the law. Other people were pressed close together as well. There was hardly room, but the friends immediately began lowering the paralyzed man down into the room below. Now, the people on the inside really had no choice but to uncomfortably make room as man and bed descended down on top of them. Everyone, of course, knew why the man was there. This kind of thing seems to happen all the time. Somebody or other just had to interrupt and ask for healing. But as the man came down, he said nothing. He just looked at Jesus. His eyes were pleading and his face showed hope even as his limp body lay beneath him on the bed, awkwardly invading the laps of some of the religious teachers who looked disgusted at him and tried to push him away. Jesus looked up at the man's friends still on the roof, their four faces looking down from above. He recognized the risk that they had taken and he smiled at them. Then he looked down at the man waiting below. There was this moment of silence as the people waited to see what would happen. In the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 9, we read the story. Matthew tells us that Jesus had returned to his own city, that is, Capernaum, which served as a kind of home base for him. And then in verse 2, Matthew says this. He says, And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Take heart, my son, said Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Those words, those beautiful words, suddenly the man was lost in them. He laid his head down and 
closed his eyes, a feeling of bliss came over him. Never before in his life had so few words felt so powerful or so good. He knew in his heart, this man has come from God. He speaks for God, and I am forgiven. The cry of his heart had been answered. Jesus looked into the man's eyes, but his gaze pierced down into the man's very soul. It was there that Jesus had read his unspoken desire. He heard those repeated prayers that had gone up to God so many times, seemingly unheard. Forgive me. Have mercy on me. While many who looked on were expecting a prayer for healing, Jesus sensed this man's greater need. He saw the faith that was exercised by the man's friends. He saw the longing and the hope in the man's eyes. He recognized a man who had been discouraged, who had been cast out by those who represented God, by those who misrepresented God. Take heart, he said. Be of good courage. The man's despair had come even more from that burden of shame and guilt that he carried than from the limp, heavy body that tethered him to the earth. And with those words, Jesus set him free. Your sins are forgiven. Not your sins have been forgiven. Not God has forgiven you and I'm here to tell you about it. Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. The difference was perhaps subtle, yet unmistakable. Immediately in the room, eyebrows went up, a few gasps were heard. The religious scholars and teachers of the law sat stunned and then began to look sideways at each other as if to say, did you hear what I just heard? Did he just claim to forgive that man's sins? He just committed blasphemy. In Matthew 9, 2, it says, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier? To say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? Well, it's a good question, church. Which is easier? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise and walk? Maybe I should ask this, which is easier to ask for? Lord, forgive me for this sin that I have done again, or... Lord, heal this ailment. And, and let me ask you this, which is easier to believe? That Jesus will accept you and all of your problems and your habits and addictions, that he will welcome you with open arms and immediately grant you the forgiveness that you seek? Or is it easier to believe that he will provide for your basic needs in this life? Is it easier to believe in the things that you can see or the things that you can't see? Is it easier to pray for forgiveness, which you may never in this life have any external evidence to prove that you have received, or to pray for something physical, something tangible, which you will immediately know whether you have received or not? Perhaps you find that you are a little like one of the two groups in this story. Maybe you can identify with both groups. The two groups at this house in Capernaum approach Jesus' question from two different sides. On one side is the paralyzed man and his friends. The paralyzed man and his friends exercised hope, even faith, in coming to Jesus. By risking so much, by being so bold and so audacious as to not give up when they encountered obstacles in the way of getting to Jesus. Maybe they didn't know for certain that Jesus would accept their friend or heal him or look kindly upon him. 
And yet they trusted enough to hope that he would. And then they trusted enough to try it, to stick their neck out and to risk being laughed at and embarrassed and turned away empty-handed. And Jesus recognized their faith. And when he saw it, he said to the man, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Their faith and their need brought them to Jesus. They came to him with hope and silently pleaded for his mercy. And they were accepted. On the other side, then, were the scribes, the religious scholars, the teachers of the law. Their attitude was different. They, too, had come to Jesus. They were near him. They sat at his feet and listened to him. And yet, when Jesus forgave the man's sins, they scoffed. Do you ever do that? Have you ever heard God offering to forgive you for the hurt you have caused others, saying to you, come to me and I will forgive you? And yet you're not really sure if you can believe it. Will you really? You say to yourself. Jesus asked them, why are you thinking such evil things? Church, do you ever scoff at a person who expresses gratitude for God's forgiveness? Perhaps you roll your eyes and you think, yeah, right. Beware of thinking evil things. Beware of being like these religious scholars and teachers of the law, the ones who came to Jesus and sat at his feet, not to learn from him, but to scoff at what he had to say. The ones who came to him and surrounded him, not to learn from him and become one of his followers, but to block the path of those who sought his help. When you come to Jesus, come with the attitude of the paralyzed man and his friends who risked everything to present their needs to him. When you pray to God, let your need and your trust in who he is give you boldness to approach him in his temple seated in unspeakable glory on the throne of the universe. Be audacious in your pursuit of him. Be persistent and undeterred by the obstacles people will put in your path. Risk everything. Go for broke. Stop at nothing to come to him with every need that you have, from the most insignificant to the greatest, most outlandish request. Jesus will look upon your faith and answer your prayer. But beware, if you are a religious hypocrite, beware if you scoff at his promises, beware if you do anything to discourage or prevent someone else from coming to him. Jesus directed his attention to these religious teachers. He said in Matthew 9, beginning with verse 4, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowds saw it, they were afraid. And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. And church, if you had been there, you would have praised God too. What an amazing sight. Get up, pick up your bed, and go home, Jesus had said. And instantly, the man began to stand up. He had been paralyzed, but suddenly, he just stood up. He stood up right there over the religious scholars and the teachers of the law. He stood right up over some of the very ones who had said, there is nothing we can do for people like you. He just stood up right in front of them. I'm not sure who was more shocked, this newly restored man or these religious hypocrites. He bent down and picked up his bed. He looked back at Jesus with a kind of shocked smile on his face. And then he stepped over some of those religious teachers on his way out the door while they just sat there. They had looked down at him before, unable to stand, crippled by paralysis.
But now they were the ones who couldn't move. They had scoffed at him because of his sins and his paralysis. Then they scoffed at Jesus when he forgave his sins. But Jesus showed them and everyone else who was there that day that he could forgive sins. That he could forgive sins and heal every disease. And he still can. He can forgive sins. And he can heal disease. He can restore broken hearts and broken bones. He can set you straight if your problem is paralysis. And he can set you straight if your problem is that you are a hypocrite. He can heal you if you're a victim. He can restore you if you're broken by what someone else has done to you. He will accept you if you come to him with humility. He will accept you if you come to him with hope. Church, he will accept you if you come to him pleading. And he will accept you if you come to him with your needs. He will accept you if you come to him boldly. He will accept you if you have to break up somebody's house to get to him. Jesus indeed has authority to forgive sins. And he proved it that day by healing a paralyzed man. Not everybody believed he could forgive sins, but he proved it. Can you believe it? Somebody say amen. Church, the one who can forgive you is Jesus. The one who can fix you is Jesus. The one who will sit with you is Jesus. The one who will hurt with you is Jesus. The one who will accept you is Jesus. The one who loves you is Jesus. The one who will show you mercy is Jesus. And the one who will give you justice is Jesus. The one you need is Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the name that is above every other name. Jesus is the name that commands armies of angels. In the name of Jesus, great men are humbled and the humble are made great. In the name of Jesus, hypocrites are exposed and sinners are forgiven. At the mention of of the name of Jesus, demons tremble and flee. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Our God, our just judge, our friend, Jesus. Amen.